ambitious leaders commanding two of the world's biggest populations and each on a mission to advance their country's own best interests, India and China. History has been created today. Applauding the grand success of India's space program and putting a satellite in orbit around Mars and taking his call to make in India worldwide, Prime Minister Narendra Modi has out to drive his country's economy on a track to outpace China. After over 25 years of breakneck growth, China's economy is now stumbling off the fast track. President Xi Jinping is managing the slowdown with efforts to boost domestic spending while cracking down hard on corruption. But is the world's largest democracy truly ready to overtake the world's biggest single-party ruled state as the next investment hotspot? And what would it mean for the world if the two countries put aside decades of distrust and forge a brand new alliance? We sit down with three unique perspectives to explore the intricate relationship between India and China. Ranga Rajan Velamore, China CEO of Infosys, one of India's largest IT companies. Anat Krishnan, China correspondent of India Today, and Haiyan Wang, managing partner of the China India Institute, all at the table this month on China. Ranga Rajan Velamore, Haiyan Wang, and Anath Krishnan, welcome to On China. It's been predicted that India will outpace China in terms of economic output this year. Why is this happening now? I mean, we have to remember that if you look at the scale of China and India, like, and if you look at nominal GDP, China is five times the size of India. And if you look at real uh, GDP, it's about three or four times. So even if China is going to add two or three percent every year and India grows at seven or eight percent, in real terms, actually, China is still pulling away from India. So I think if India grows 7.5 percent this year and China grows 7.4 percent, I think it makes for a good headline. But I think people shouldn't get too carried away about what it means in terms of the gap between China and India. So bottom line, if I was to put a sizable chunk of capital in one country, India or China, for 10 years, where should I put that money? I would say, I would give a short and long-term answer. If you are an institutional investor, go for India. If you invest in India, you are going to get high returns. If you are going to be a direct investor, I, I think if you are focusing on China, you should continue to focus on China as a direct investor. Probably in the next two to three years, you should diversify into India. You also have to look at India versus China sector by sector. Sectors, so if we look at technology, for example, India traditionally has been very good at IT services, software, not so much at hardware, not so much at manufacturing. I mean, could that change and, and will it change? I think uh, the new direction of make in India and also you have to remember that now Chinese manufacturers need access to uh, low cost labor. And uh, they are also turning uh, into India because they believe there is an access to a labor pool, which is lower cost, and access to a market as well. So Make in India is going to help, and uh, India will also turn into hardware, and, but it is going to grow from where it is today. Make in India is a new tagline under the Modi government. In fact, Absolutely. we've seen the advertisements running nonstop on CNN recently. Yeah. I think after Modi took over, he's made it very clear that he's going to continue what he did when he was the chief minister of Gujarat state, which is one of the most foreign investment friendly states. So I've seen a lot of enthusiasm, especially when they've brought out the Make in India campaign. But I'm also a little bit uh, cautious because so far I feel it is uh, been more of a tagline rather than a policy shift. They say, well, we're hearing these good sounds come out of India, but we're still waiting to see what it's going to actually mean in terms of new policies. So you, when you said that uh, could India compete with China, I don't think that that's going to be happening, not in the next 20 years. After 30 years of dedicated efforts in building China into a manufacturing powerhouse, it would take a long time for India to build that manufacturing capabilities, it's not just about lower labor cost. You have to have a complex industry cluster of supply chains. You have to have the knowledge. You have to have the skills. You have to be connected to selling to the international markets. And if you look at what India is progressing, I think it's still progressing too, too low, too slow. And do you also need a centrally planned economy? I want to talk about the connection between economics sure. and politics. Because India, we all know, world's largest democracy. Yeah. There are free elections. China, single party state, no free elections. Sure. But is one system 
more economically advantageous than the other. When it comes to manufacturing, what China's political system does is it can move at a fast speed. For example, land acquisition. Uh, China can, you know, give land to private enterprises and carve out land for industrial zones. It can set up uh, the beautiful industrial zones to invite investors in. You look at how slow the land acquisition bill is moving in India. Without land acquisition, who is it going to come to build factories? I would uh, disagree with Haiyan and I wouldn't give a blanket endorsement of the China model. I mean, you speak to people in China now, and I think the chickens are coming home to roost And when you have a really powerful central government without checks and balances in the provinces. And you look at land acquisition problems, there's a lot of grievances and unrest. I mean, if you go to the provinces in China, and, and, I, and as an Indian, I have to say, I'm glad to see that the land acquisition bill hasn't been rushed through. That parliament, I mean, our parliament can look dysfunctional. It looks chaotic and messy. But I mean, as a citizen of a democratic country, you're thankful that it goes through this process. It's debated at every stage. I mean, India, when our constitution was written and, and was formulated in 1950, I mean, the biggest thing is we took into account the fact that we are such an ethnically, linguistically diverse country. And that's why we, we came up with a political system that's a federal system, unlike China. And we've intentionally devolved power to different states so states can decide their own policies. It's not like China where, you know, Beijing snaps its fingers and the provinces have to jump in line. So I think the China model cannot and should not be transplanted to India because we have this entirely different structure that keeps in mind different interests of different states. But of course, uh, in, in such democratic setup, when you come to a coalition and uh, the political forces don't align, you, you do see that problem. And systematic evolution of leadership is also a challenge in democracy because you see, uh, you, if you see the Chinese system, there is a systematic evolution of dem uh, you know, leadership with the best people are brought in to uh, find the best people among the best talent to come into uh, to be part of responsible leadership. When we're having a conversation about India and China, we have to address the space race. Um, it was in October of 2014. That was when China successfully launched an unmanned mission, which paved the way to a lunar mission. That happened a month after India already successfully reached its destination for its Mars mission. Mm -hmm. It seems to me, is India surpassing China when it comes to space? Of course, uh, if, if you look from the distance perspective, Indian space has surpassed <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, the, the Chinese uh, um, reach. I think it's not about reaching somewhere. What these two countries have been able to leverage these research in terms of addressing a lot of manufacturing needs. For example, whatever I've heard, the, 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 the precision technologies that has been used in Chinese space industry is accessible to many of the uh, industries around, which that's why Chinese machinery manufacturing is making progress. The same way if you take Indian space research, it has added a lot of value to the industry around and as well as certain uh, you know you know equipments that are in terms of uh, people using for day-to-day -day use as well I, I, I don't see that truly as a, a measurement of technology advancement and I think a lot of that is building a country image and and uh, you nationalism. Look, nationalism national national image of being projecting the country as the superpower or the future future superpower and, and there isn't a military angle to it because a lot of the technology used in the space race have military applications as well. No, I'd agree, I'd, I agree with Ranga actually. I don't think it's about face, about nationalism. Of course it's one part of it, but I think it's a huge credit to, to India and to China as well that they've been able to do this and develop these technologies at a time when both weren't getting all that much support uh, from the West in terms of high-end technology. Narendra Modi, Xi Jinping, when you put them side by side, how do they compare? Narendra Modi, Xi Jinping, when you put them side by side, how do they compare? 
that. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I see a lot of uh, fascinating, uh, striking parallels between the two. And in fact, uh, you know, when Xi Jinping first met uh, Narendra Modi uh, after he took over, this was uh, last year in July in Brazil. And uh, apparently, one of the first things that uh, Xi Jinping told Modi was, you know, our personal stories are so similar. Mm -hmm. And uh, what he was talking about was the fact that they both toiled away for years without recognition. I mean, Xi Jinping, of course, didn't mention his princeling background, but <laughs> but I mean, he referred to the fact that when he was in Yan'an, he spent years toiling away, and Modi did the same thing, working for the RSS as a volunteer. So he said, you know, we can relate to one another, and I think they both look at themselves look at themselves as these strong decision-making leaders and, and there's a great sense of optimism now I think in India and China that both of them can actually sit down and possibly do something transformative with the relationship. Because Modi is the product of the Indian's democracy uh, and Xi Jinping has the power being the party secretary, being the head of the state, being head of the military, Xi Jinping has a lot more power in getting things down. Xi Jinping can move things faster. Xi Jinping can have a 10-year horizon to plan, to, 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 to gradually move towards the goal. And Modi has to contend with building coalitions and, and worry about re-elections. So his hard time horizon may not be as long as Xi Jinping's. In that sense, I do see a lot more power in Xi Jinping to get things down. Oh, that's no doubt about uh, that. That's the systemic difference between the two countries. But if you look at the personalities, I would say both are uh, both are doers. They are action oriented, and uh, whatever they are saying, they give a commitment on certain things to happen by certain date. And uh, there is a review mechanism they are building in in that progress. That's number one. Number two, they both are looking at uh, both have ability to express their displeasure on any of those actions. You know, both have, have demonstrated in the past they can express their displeasure directly. Number three, I'd say both, as you know, Hans said that, you know, building the coalition across the uh, different countries and they are expressing their views directly and trying to build a good relationship with understanding consciously there are differences between the relationship whether it you take in day india us relationship or china us relationship they are very clear to acknowledge there are differences but still we got to build a coalition mm. and we, when we look at the two leaders one is on Facebook and Twitter. The other one isn't. We can guess who. Uh, one was <laughs> democratically elected. The other one wasn't. And the leader who is on Twitter is, in fact, the Asian leader with the biggest following on Twitter. And, and I'm wondering, between these two leaders in Asia, which one commands the most regional respect? It, it, regional respect, it, it has to do with the power, I think, of the country. If you look at what has been accomplished with the AIIB and the momentum it has gathered uh, that's championed by China, and that is a tremendous momentum. You look at what China can bring in to, 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 to the table, whether it's capital, whether it's the construction capabilities, the infrastructure, etc. China has the muscle to mobilize its foreign exchange reserves, to mobilize a lot of the resources to, to, to build connectivity, in that sense that there's more weight to, to, to China. Yeah, I, I would qualify that because I think uh, she's absolutely right by the sheer virtue of China's economic weight. Of course, Xi Jinping is going to be able to command that kind of influence. But, I mean, we can't forget the other side of China's rise. I mean, even if uh, China is putting money into the AIIB and the Silk Road Fund, it is also building airstrips on reclaimed islands in the South China Sea. And uh, China is also involved, I mean, in uh, its relations with Japan. And if you contrast that with uh, India's relations with the region, I mean, India's rise is, I mean, if you speak to any Asian country, if it's Japan or if it's Southeast Asia, there's no question that India's rise is far less threatening than China's rise. So, I mean, I think f you have to look at China's weight as working in, in both ways. What about soft power? Um, how are these two leaders, Xi and Modi, um, flexing their soft power muscle overseas? I, I see actually some changes. Last year, perhaps, you know, with the East China Sea, South China Sea, China was seen as being a bit more assertive. A bully. Uh, assertive. 
but this, <laughs> I mean, this year, I think that the dialogues with Japan, the, 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 even the military di dialogues with India, the ASEAN common, uh, common communities that uh, what has been emphasized, I do see that China is giving a lot more emphasis on the soft, soft power. Mm -hmm. You want to add something? Yeah, I think I'd give higher marks to Modi when it comes to uh, exercising uh, soft power in terms of diplomacy. Uh, if you look at India's relationships with its major countries, if you look at India and the United States, I think the relationship is far healthier now than it was maybe 12, 18 months ago. The same works with India-Japan relations, which I think were hamstrung by India's caution about dealing with China, which is no longer the case. If you look at the way India is presenting itself to East Asia as well, I think Modi deserves higher marks for that. And I think there's still a question mark when it comes to China's soft power, because if you look at the AIIB and the Silk Road Fund, it's still a kind of hard diplomatic power. You're taking the cash and throwing it down on the table. I, I mean, it's, I think a lot of it is with people lining up to get a slice of the infrastructure investment pie. Another one is the issue of Tibet and the fact that India has given political asylum to the Dalai Lama for the last few decades. I mean, that must be a thorn in the side of China. trust is there between Xi Jinping and Narendra Modi? I think I have to look at the, the wider bilateral relationship between India and China and the fact is uh, you can't uh, hi you can't sweep the problems under the carpet. There's still a lot of strategic mistrust. It's, it's, there's no denying that. And the heart of it is the boundary dispute. Because when you look at Xi Jinping's visit to India, uh, India and China signed these two big agreements for industrial parks, but that wasn't what dominated the headlines. The headlines was about a standoff that was taking place on the, on the border. So I think as long as you have these issues that are unresolved, it's going to be very difficult for both countries to say we have complete trust with each other. I don't agree. Uh, uh, and yes, there is a trust deficit. I mean, if you look at the relationship between any big superpowers, whether it's US or, US or, or China, there is always an element of a mistrust. That aside, it has, since the border issue has been in place, it has not stopped from the economic integration. As you said, over the last uh, two decades, China-India trade has been growing at nearly uh, 30% a year. That is far greater than a 9% annual growth of the world trade, far greater than China's trade with the rest of the world, far greater than China's, uh, India's trade with the rest of the world. And I think that as pragmatic as President Xi is, as pragmatic as, as Prime Minister Modi is, economic integration is going to happen regardless of the 100% trust or not. Yeah, I don't think you can divorce uh, the politics from uh, the from economic integration. Maybe it worked uh, over the past decade when it was a buy-sell relationship. I mean, trade was mostly driven by India exporting ores and importing equipment. But when you're thinking of a more integrated relationship as we are now, when you're thinking of Chinese companies coming to India and building big infrastructure projects, it's very difficult when public opinion is still very suspicious of all things China, and I think that's still the case. A small example, if you look at India's seven northeastern states, which are probably in the most dire need of infrastructure, it's inconceivable for any of those states to allow a Chinese company to come in and build roads because we are more comfortable with dealing with Japan. Because we think of uh, these seven states as being strategically important, it's still inconceivable to allow a Chinese company to come in and do that. And as long as the border remains unresolved, I think it will still be the elephant in the room. If India suspect China's intentions and hence block Chinese investment. And that is really unfortunately to India's disadvantage because Chinese not only bring low cost capital, Chinese capital equipment is one third of the price of what you can import from Japan and G Germany. And what China can bring to the table is really beneficial to, Ch to India's economy. The sooner the suspicion is reduced, the better it is for China and for India. I'm hearing you, but still I'm thinking about these possible um, just factors that might just complicate the relationship. Another one is the issue of Tibet and the fact that India has given political asylum to the Dalai Lama for the last few decades. I mean, that must be a thorn in the side of China. That, I, I see that perhaps le as less of a less. thorn. What is really critical is to maintain peace and tranquility at the line of actual control. You know, border issue is not going to be easy to be solved. And, and it's not something that you can flip a finger and say, let's settle it. It is towards that goal, but 
So leaving that aside, if we can maintain peace and tranquility, if we can maintain military dialogues so that uh, a minor incursions would not erupt into a war, and that doesn't prevent from economic integration, economic cooperation. Yeah, the challenge is going to be managing these disputes, and I, for one, don't think they're going to go away. Um, I don't think having greater exchanges is going to be a silver bullet. Um, I think as long as, I mean, India's relationship with the United States, India may never become an ally of the U.S., but the fact is it is a source of uh, worry in China. In India, what China is doing in the neighborhood, and whether it's in Sri Lanka or the Maldives, is a source of concern. Uh, China's relations with Pakistan is, a, is another source of concern. I mean, one of the parts of the Silk Road is a huge infrastructure project that uh, China is building right through uh, Kashmir, which, is a, which India claims. So, I mean, all these issues are going to be present. And the big challenge is how do you manage this and still move forward? And I don't think we're ever going to come to a situation where these are, these are going to cease to be, you know, the thorny issues. If India and China are able to put aside these thorny issues and forge a solid alliance, what can they achieve together and what does it mean for the rest of the world? If these two countries come together and bring prosperity, 40% of the people are going to be prosperous, which means that you are going to solve the world's problem. Both countries have complementing resources, and if they are able to come together, there can be a new, uh, new kind of uh, world order that can be created in this entire region, which is going to benefit the entire Asia. We've seen a glimpse of it if you look at uh, what India and China are doing uh, in terms of setting up this BRICS new development bank and also with the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank to which India is actually one of the main founding partners. So I think when they come together and put their weight behind a global initiative, I think what you'll see is a push to reform the financial architecture which both India and China have very deep common grievances about. They see the whole world order as being stacked against them. It's, it, they see it as being favoring the West. So when they do come together, I think you can see at least more pressure in terms of changing world institutions as they are today. If you look at the, from the lenses of the 2030s, these two countries will become perhaps one of the most important bilateral economic relationships. China and India working peacefully together will set an example uh, on how the rising powers can work, work uh, together. And I also think that both of them are in terms of world orders, in terms of global governance, they have a lot of things in common, whether it's to address climate change, whether it's to address a lot of the United Nations human development goals, and, and they can learn and benefit uh, from each other. And we'll leave it at that. Anand Krishnan, Haiyan Wang, and Ranga Rajan Bellamore, thank you so much for joining me to talk about the work in progress that is the relationship between India and China.